Have you ever wondered about the differences between a Docker container and a virtual machine and why that matters? Today I'll take you through what a VM is, what a Docker container is, and what the key differences are, and why you care. So strap in, hold on, and get ready to drink from the fire hose of knowledge. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. Odds are that by now you've heard of both virtual machines and Docker containers, and you might even use one or both of them. But most folks still don't know the fundamental differences between them, and that's what we're going to explore today. Both cases let you take a bundle of software, including the operating system and all of your configured applications, and package them up in a reusable way. Big picture, a virtual machine runs a complete, dedicated operating system installed just for your package, whereas a container runs side-by-side -side on your existing operating system, sharing resources with it. Now imagine you've set up a perfect development environment on your system. You're running Ubuntu Linux, you have installed and configured your favorite code editor, several development tools like Git, Node, and Python, and now you have everything tuned just the way you like it. You want to ensure that this environment can be replicated easily without going through the whole setup process again every time, and then whether it's for backup purposes or to share with your colleagues or to deploy on other machines. You could solve this problem with both a container and a virtual machine. So let's look at how we would do both, and that will serve to illustrate some of the major differences. To do it using a virtual machine, you first need a system with a hypervisor. Your image needs a virtual machine to run on after all, and it's the hypervisor software that provides it. Think of it as a traffic cop for your computer's resources. It directs traffic, making sure that your hardware plays nice not with just one operating system, but with several, all at the same time. Each OS operates in its own compartment, unaware of its neighbors, while the hypervisor manages them all, keeping your system stable and efficient. It's virtualization at its finest, all courtesy of that hypervisor. Now, you can install a dedicated hypervisor operating system like Proxmox, or you can just enable the Hyper-V feature on Windows. Or you could install a virtualization package like VMware. Each works a little differently. To put a finer point on it, there are two distinct types of hypervisors. The first is the Type 1 hypervisor, or bare metal style. It runs directly on the physical hardware of the host system and does not require a host operating system, as it acts as the OS itself. This approach offers better performance and efficiency because it has direct access to the physical hardware. A Type 2 hypervisor, on the other hand, and these are not very creatively named, but a Type 2 runs as an application within a standard operating system. It relies on the host operating system below it to do the hard work of managing the CPU, memory, and other hardware. It does the same job of creating a virtual environment that can be run, but instead of managing shared access to the real underlying hardware, it creates a simulated hardware environment. So what's the difference between a Type 2 hypervisor and an emulator? Well, while the emulator simulates the CPU as well, with a hypervisor, you're still running on the real CPU. And so with a hypervisor, the underlying architecture is always the same between the host and the VM. Both will be x86, both will be ARM, or whatever. With an emulator, however, you get a simulated CPU, and the CPU doesn't need to match the physical one. You can run a 6502 emulator on a Threadripper, for example, which is precisely what I do when working on old code. But with a hypervisor running on AMD64, you can only run AMD64 code. Now naturally, running under an emulator adds this layer of indirection and some inefficiency. The Darwin code that runs Intel binaries on Mac Silicone does so at a surprising speed and proves that emulation does not need to be slow, at least if it has some support on the chip to help it along. Now on a Type 1 VM, the CPU of the virtual machine must align with the host because modern CPUs support virtualization natively in the chip and so the CPUs are prepared to be shared amongst sessions. This means that your code runs at native speed on the real CPU, and the results can be impressive. In fact, I did extensive testing of Ubuntu running as WSL2 under Hyper-V versus bare metal, and the results were consistently within 2%. And yet, containers can be even more efficient than that. Now, thanks to the way the algorithm on YouTube works these days, I have to do the stuff that I'd normally do at the end of the video here in the middle. So I'll just take a moment to remind you that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes. So if you're finding today's episode to be informative or entertaining, I would be quite pleased if you could leave me one of each today. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you. And if you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. It's everything I know now about living your best life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. Now let's get right back to our task of packaging up this dev environment. 
will make that custom dev environment into a virtual machine and then host it on a hypervisor like Proxmox or Windows Hyper-V. Long story short, once everything is set up, all you do is take a snapshot of the VM. This snapshot includes the entire state of the VM, the operating system, installed software, disk images, your configurations, and any files you've added. It also serves as a handy backup. Whenever you need to replicate your environment, you can use this snapshot to create a new VM that is an exact replica of the original setup at the snapshot time. This can be done on any machine that supports that hypervisor, regardless of the underlying hardware. I mean, it has to mash and you have to have enough RAM, but it's not directly tied to the original machine. You can also share this VM snapshot with friends or colleagues, subject to licensing and so on. They can load the snapshot on their own hypervisor, instantly getting them up and running with the same development setup. Now, how can we do this with a container? Well, instead of using a full VM, you can containerize the environment using Docker. You create a Docker file that defines all the necessary installation and configuration steps. It would contain your Ubuntu base image, and then there would be lines to install Node, Python, your code editor, and copy in your configuration files. It reminds me of one of the better Docker memes that I've seen. But it works on my machine. Then we'll ship your machine. And that is how Docker was born. Unlike the VM case where you just get it working and take a snapshot of it, with a container you have to be able to create the Docker file and express all of your installation and setup steps and dependencies within it. It's not rocket science, but it is one more thing to learn. Next, you use the Docker program itself to build the container image based on the instructions in your Docker file. It's like compiling the Docker file. This image now represents your development environment. You can even then push this container image to a global registry like the Docker Hub. From there, it can be pulled and run on any system in the world with Docker installed, instantly setting up the same environment defined in the image from anywhere on the web. I have a copy of my LED Wi-Fi server setup that runs on Linux, and so I've built a container that is available from anywhere at any time on any system running Docker. Thanks to the make file and some help from my friend Rutger, the Docker file lists everything needed, including the .NET dependencies. You can make changes to the source code and then the make file recompiles the code, builds the container image, and uploads the new Docker container to the global repository all in about one minute. Containers are more lightweight and start faster than VMs. They're ideal if you only need to replicate an application and its immediate dependencies rather than the whole OS setup. On its face, this makes it look like the no-brainer answer is to containerize everything. And while there's certainly been a push in that direction, there are still many excellent uses of virtual machines. So let's look at some of the essential differences. The VM approach offers full isolation with its own OS, but can get suitable for scenarios where the underlying OS needs to be controlled or where you need an environment identical down to the OS level. It's easier for systems that need comprehensive testing or full stack development closely mirroring a production environment. If a security exploit in a Docker container achieves ring zero escalation, it has ring zero access to the entire system, not just to its own container. With a VM, that damage would be constrained to the single VM, as each VM is fully isolated from all of the others. The container approach is more efficient in terms of resource usage and is quicker to deploy. Containers are best suited for applications where OS level changes are minimal, and the focus is more about setting up the application side. They're great for microservices or applications where you want to be able to scale up new instances horizontally because it takes less resources to spin up new containers than it does new VMs. Both methods provide ways to snapshot and replicate environments, so the choice between using a VM or a container can depend on the specific needs for isolation, portability, and the level of granularity and control over the operating system that you need. The biggest difference between the two revolves around how they handle their operating environments and interact with the underlying hardware. A virtual machine is like a house that has its own infrastructure, plumbing, electrical, heating, and so on. Each VM includes the application, the necessary binaries, libraries, and an entire operating system running on virtualized hardware managed by the hypervisor. This setup is highly isolated and secure, but it can be resource heavy because you're replicating the whole OS for each VM. Typically, you must also allocate a certain amount of RAM to each VM, whether they're making active use of it or not. Docker containers, on the other hand, are like apartments in a building that share the building's infrastructure. Containers still provide applications with their necessities, binaries and libraries, but they share the host system's OS kernel and sometimes the binaries and libraries themselves. This makes containers much lighter and faster than VMs as they require less overhead to run an additional instance. They can have RAM limitations imposed upon them, but they don't require you to allocate that RAM to them in advance. Rather, you set a specific limit and they draw from a shared pool up to their assigned limits. 
In essence, while both technologies offer a way to package and isolate applications, VMs are more like independent systems with their own full-fledged environments, whereas containers are more efficient, sharing as much of the host system as possible without sacrificing the isolation that makes them similar to VMs in functionality. Now, a hypervisor's job might be a complicated thing to actually implement, but conceptually, the notion that it shares a single CPU among several live operating systems isn't a difficult one to comprehend. Containers are a bit trickier, however. Containers provide a lightweight method to isolate applications and their environments from each other on a shared operating system. They make it possible for you to run multiple applications in isolation on a single physical machine, all sharing the same kernel but appearing to each application as if it is the sole occupant of the operating system. Now, I promised you a fire hose of knowledge, and I hope you're thirsty, because to understand how Docker compartmentalizes images and isolates them from each other, we need to understand two important Linux kernel features. These mechanisms that make containers possible are largely attributed to cgroups and namespaces, which are features provided by the Linux kernel. Windows also provides similar functionality via the job object, but we'll stick to Linux for today since that's where Docker is the most common. Cgroups, or control groups, are a Linux feature that allows you to allocate resources, such as CPU time, system memory, network bandwidth, or combinations of these, among user-defined groups of tasks running on a system. Think of cgroups as a way to manage a budget of resources and distribute that budget across different applications, as if they were departments. With cgroups, you can ensure that each container has access to the resources it needs without stepping on the toes of other containers. You can also ensure that one container can't hog all the resources and starve the others, maintaining a level of performance predictability and, hopefully, system stability. Now, namespaces, on the other hand, are a feature that partitions kernel resources so that one set of processes sees one set of resources, while another set of processes sees a different set of resources. The system resources are isolated in such a way that processes in different namespaces cannot see or interact with each other. This includes aspects of the system like the process ID space, network interfaces, mount points, and the user ID space. So while cgroups manage the resources that containers can use, namespaces dictate what containers can see and do. When a process is running in a container, namespaces ensure that it only sees its own environment, its own files, its own network, its own running processes, and so on. So taken together, cgroups and namespaces form the backbone of container technology. They combine the resource management and isolation to allow containers to run independently without the overhead of starting and running a separate virtual machine for each application. This results in a much more efficient use of the underlying system resources, faster startup times for applications, and higher density of applications running on one machine, or across a whole group if you get into Kubernetes, which we will not talk about today. The use of both of these systems means that you can run multiple containers on a single machine, each with its own secure and isolated space, but all being much more lightweight and faster than a traditional VM. So at the end of the day then, whether you select a container or a virtual machine depends largely on what it is you're trying to accomplish. If it scales well horizontally and can be configured easily in a Docker file, and if you don't require the ultimate in isolation, then a container is likely for you. If it's more of a vertical app with larger memory and CPU requirements, or if it's a complicated environment to set up, or you need that extra layer of isolation, then a VM is the way to go. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time right here in Dave's Garage. <laughs>